we can do. You probably have a little message come up and you probably got to say okay or something. So anyway, uh, I'm I'm Scott, and I'm in Arizona. I'm not in Arizona. I'm in Oregon. And uh, anyway, uh, I want to introduce Margaret. And you can go first, Margaret. Tell them who you are and where you're from. Margaret Poland. I am the newly elected vice president for public policy on the National FCE board, and I am your workshop presenter today on the silent killer. And I live in Yuma, Arizona, where it's still real warm. Okay. That's and enough right. for here. And Loretta, you want, oh, she's muted. And I'll just tell you, Loretta is in Prineville, Oregon. She's at a library and she does not have a computer. She doesn't have internet, but she still makes the effort to get there. And how about Linda? Uh, Linda Hess from Kansas. Okay. And Barbara Thomas. Yep, I'm here from Wasilla, Alaska. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. And I think I missed Janet. Janet Stockbrand, Prospect, Oregon. Can you turn it up just to let My husband plays that TV so loud that okay. it's affecting my hearing. Okay, go ahead, Janet. I, you got as loud as it goes there. Janet okay. Stockbrand, Prospect, Oregon. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Perfect. Uh, Thelma. Didn't I see a Thelma on here? Yes. Thelma Lamb from Honolulu, Hawaii, guest of Baba Sheeter. Well, welcome. And Thank you. Stay in guest. You might introduce all of them. Okay. Tina Bailey. Dolores Walden. And she's got her mouth full. <laughs> okay. And is it Jane? Yes, it is. I'm Jane Mahaffey. I'm the East District Director for the state of Nebraska. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Anne Ingen. Oh, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm from McMinnville, Oregon. Well, welcome. And McMinnville, Tennessee. And is it Marja? I yes. On here. Yes, I'm from Portland, Oregon. Oh, well, welcome. And I got Bonnie Teeples. Are you on there now, Bonnie? Hey, Bonnie. She's, <laughs> she's working. She's from Oregon. She's my better half. And I got another. I I thought I saw another Bonnie on there someplace. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Russell, Alaska. Well, welcome. Is there anybody I missed? Me. <laughs> oh, Tony. I see you in there now. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm, I'm Tony from Oregon. She's in our study group. She's one of our new members. She's a she's our best new member. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> and Joanne. Thank you. Come on. Hi, Scott. You want to tell them where you're from? I'm from Hawaii. Okay. I'm the big island, the big island of Hawaii. All right. Anybody else I missed? I think we got everybody in. Sometimes they just kind of pop in there. So I got 15 plus two. We got 17 of us on there today. So I'm going to turn the time over to Margaret. And she's a little nervous about this. She did this presentation at the national conference, did a wonderful job. We are actually going to do this in Oregon at our state conference again. And matter of fact, we're going to have a guest instructor. And she's going to fly up and do that for us. And we're excited as can be. So you guys. Just warm it up a little bit. It, it's not too late. <laughs> it's not too late to register for the uh, conference there in Oregon. So but when, where's she from? She's from Yuma, Arizona. Oh, that's right. Yep. Yeah, I'm from the desert southwest where it's nice and warm. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, All right. I'm gonna actually spotlight her to let's see spotlight area. All right, so Margaret, the time is yours. Okay, let's see if I can do this. All right, can you see that? What's that? Share. Can you see the PowerPoint? Not yet. 
Oh, okay. We'll get it. Down on the bottom, a little green one. It and I are having an issue. Come on. Stop it. <laughs> okay. All right. Come on. All right. You're just being a pain in the... Excuse my language. Come on. Mm. 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 Well, we're having fun, aren't we? Okay, so you're clicking on the little green one on the bottom. All right, I'm going. <clears throat> All right, so now it's not being good. It's not being nice to me today. We practiced. And... I know we did. Okay. Did you email your PowerPoint to Scott? Yes, I did. Okay. okay. I did. I had it two minutes ago. And then finding it, of course, oh, there it is. Well, come back. Thank you. Now. Just let me know if I can help you. Okay. Now, can you see it? No. No. Nope. I'll let you know if we can see it. Why is it not letting me do what I'm supposed to do? Mm. Okay. Oh. Faye's right. I can actually bring it up if you want me to do that. And You may have to, for whatever reason. I'll have to find it, though. It'll take me a minute to get there. Okay. What's up? How's that? Oh, we got it. We got it? You're up. You're up. You're up. And by the way, can I, for you guys that are watching on your own screen, if you have like three or four pictures on the left hand, right hand side, you can actually minimize that. If you go to the top, there's some little buttons. One of them has multiple ones on there. And if you just click on the one on the far left, all you do is see the name of the person who's presenting. And that'll give you a little more room on the PowerPoint. You're up and running, Margaret. All right. Okay. So I've introduced myself, you know who I am. And I wanted to let you know that the silent killer takes 12,810 lives in the US on an annual basis. And that number is growing. Shockingly, it takes 207,000 lives globally. So it's not really a nice thing. So what is this, this silent killer? Are we gonna be one of its victims? This is what we're here to learn this morning. So let's talk about our O's. And yes, those are Cheerios. What are they? Where are they? Do we need them? What do we do if the dreaded C word or cancer is diagnosed? What kind of questions am I gonna ask? And we can be overwhelmed when we find out we have this silent killer. So O's refer to our, the, o, the O's are our ovaries. They are about the size and the shape of an almond. So they're not really very big. They're a pair of glands that are in the female reproductive system and that's where the eggs are stored. Men have sperm, women have eggs. This is where our eggs are stored. 
And also, one of the things that it does that we need is that this is also where estrogen is manufactured. They're held in place by ligaments on either side of the uterus so that it's all right there. They're transported from the ovaries to the uterus from the, uh, by way of fallopian tubes. And if you'll notice there, those little finger-like things right there by the more white ovary, those are fimbrae. And that's what guides the egg from the ovary into the fallopian tube. And then it maneuvers itself down and into the uterus. Those are important because they, for human reproduction and for the hormones that they produce. A projection report from Global Pan, which is a Windows-based software program which provides access to a worldwide database of cancer incidents and mortality rates. So it's around the world. And, okay, go back. I will leave it right there. Is, and its prediction is that by 2040, and you know, that's not all that far away, that's less than 20 years, the number of women that are diagnosed in the world with ovarian cancer is gonna go up by 37%. So that will be close to half a million women in the world are gonna get diagnosed from that. The number that are going to die from ovarian cancer is gonna go up 50%, which means it's just over 300,000 people. It is the seventh most common cancer in women and the eighth most common cause of, from death from cancer in women. In the United States, there are going to be approximately 20,000 new diagnoses this year of ovarian cancer. It ranks fifth among the cancer deaths among women. And it accounts for more deaths than any other cancer of the female reproductive system. And it's more common in white women and in Hasidic Jewish women. So on your screen, you have four shapes. You will have a triangle, a square, a Z and a circle. So pick your favorite, something that you think describes you. Okay, how many of you chose a triangle? These are the broad-based intellectual ones in society, the deep thinkers. They're the ones who send out surveys. We all know these people, right? They send out surveys, they're organizational people. They're gonna ask the questions like, prove it. Please put it in writing. It's not in the budget. These are the foundation people and the pillars of any organization. How about squares? These are the solid citizens, the reliable ones. They always vote. And I always ask, did you all vote, all of you squares? They carry out the responsibilities of the organization and they do the work of society. They always say, it's a tough job, but it's got to be done. And if it's going to be, it's up to me. And then we come to the cute Z's. These are the creative ones, the idea people. Z's love change. We all know these people too, don't we? They're the ones who like to change just because it's time for a change. They're the dreamers, the leaders. Why not, they ask. Z's always, always come up with new ways of doing things, but they let those nice squares carry them out. They dream more than the triangles think is practical. That leaves us with the fourth one, circles. A circle stands for peace, harmony, and security. And you're gonna notice that there aren't any rough spots on a circle. They keep things running smoothly. They will not rock the boat because they like calm days and quiet waters. It doesn't matter what you chose for your favorite figure. You can see if you listen, we need all four of them to make a healthy group. 
It'd be a disaster if we all came to a meeting in one shape. We were all circles or all triangles. Can you imagine what it'd be like if everyone was a circle? You can't sail very far in still waters. You need a bit of that wind to change the course and head out to sea. Now, if we were all shaped like the Z, we'd move, trust me, because they like change, we'd have a hard time staying on course. We'd sail so far and so fast, we may never reach a harbor or touch base with anyone ever again. Now, if we were all the triangles, the three sides, we'd bite me so busy charting that course, because we're, we're into those details, we might never leave port. And when the Z's say, if we can dream it, it's gonna be done. And the triangles say, buddy, it's not in the budget. Who's gonna resolve that conflict and quiet those waves? Well, we need those nice round circles. Now a group made up of workhorse square sounds wonderful because they're doing all the work. But if they're constantly loading cargo, then we're, two things are gonna happen. One, nobody's gonna chart the course. And the boat's probably going to sink because we're going to get too much cargo on it. And so who's going to chart that course? Who's going to set the sails and dream the dreams? We need everyone, every shape. All of these are important. Doesn't matter whether it's four-sided, three-sided, or no sides at all. We really do need everyone. All right. So how are you feeling? Did you all get the quiz? Scott was Scott sent out a quiz. I don't. So know. here it is. I don't think I got it sent out. Okay. Which of these are considered common symptoms of ovarian cancer? Bloating, difficulty eating or feeling full quickly. C, abdominal pain or pelvic pain. D, urinary symptoms like an urgency or frequency. E is all of the above and F is none of the above. Well, the answer is all of the above. Several studies show that ovarian cancer can produce symptoms but they don't often show up until the disease has advanced. And it can be subtle and easily mistaken for other more common problems. And we're gonna talk about that. If these symptoms occur for more than two weeks and they're not normal for you, they're new, they're unusual, in two weeks, you need to go see your doctor. And that is something you need to talk to that doctor and preferably a gynecologist is look for ovarian cancer. The second question was on screening for ovarian cancer is simple and can be done quickly and effectively at your annual gynecological exam. Is this true or false? It's false. There are no screening tests for ovarian cancer. There's nothing out there. They're working on it, but there's nothing that's been approved or even proven to work yet. Women get pap smears, but it only screens for cervical cancer. It's not for any other kind of cancer. It's not for uterine cancer fallopian tube cancer, it is strictly for cervical cancer. So this is why we're doing this, part of the reasons why we're doing this workshop is so that you know what your risk factors, especially personal risk factors are and what is common in this kind of cancer. All right, the next one was studies have shown each Studies have shown that certain factors can actually reduce a person's chances of developing ovarian cancer. So which factors can decrease that risk? A, starting our menstrual cycle after age 12. B, taking oral contraceptives. C, giving birth. 
D, breastfeeding, E, all of the above, and F is none of the above. It is all of the above. Starting our menstrual cycle after the age 12, taking oral contraceptives, giving birth, breastfeeding, all decrease the chance. Doesn't say it, you, it eliminates it, but it does decrease it. And the reason being ovulation is thought to contribute to ovarian cancer. So the more times you ovulate, the higher risk you have. So that's something to think about. It, it spurs the opportunity for the reproduction of cells stimulating cell sign signaling pathways. So you really got to think about it because it, it can, the more that happens, the more damaging DNA is in the process of releasing that egg from the ovary into the fallopian tube. Which factors are known to increase your risk of ovarian cancer? A, being over 40, B, menopause, C, hormone replacement therapy, D, obesity, and of course, E is all of the above, and F is none of the above. And the answer is E. All of those factors are linked with an increased risk of ovarian cancer. You may have heard that ovarian cancer rates are highest in women aged 55 to 64. It's true, but ovarian cancer the, the probability of getting it begins rising at age 40. My daughter was in her early 40s when she was diagnosed. The next one is which of these medical conditions can also increase one's risk of developing ovarian cancer? Endometriosis, breast cancer, uterine cancer, colon cancer, all of those or none of those? So the answer is all of the above. Endometriosis, breast cancer, uterine cancer, number one, are all part of the reproductive system and the colon is right there. So it also, if you've had that in the family, it can also increase your risk. If a close blood relative has had that. I have two granddaughters, so now they have to be aware that ovarian cancer is in the family and they have to think about what that looks like and what they need to do. If they've had colon cancer before the age of 50 or breast cancer before the age of 50, that is also a factor in what's gonna happen. The next question is, if you suspect you may be at increased risk for ovarian cancer, what's the first thing you should do? Watch for signs and symptoms? Start taking oral contraceptives? Nothing, there is no way to prevent it anyway. Talk to your doctor about your risk, all of the above or none of the above. And the answer here is talk to your doctor. Your primary care doctor, your gynecologist, everyone. It's important to watch for symptoms, not going to deny that. But if you think you are at increased risk, it is important that you don't wait for those symptoms up to appear. It's go talk to your doctor. Make them put that on your chart. Every time you go, remind them. Your doctor can recommend, one of the things they may recommend is genetic testing. Because like with breast cancer, there's BRCA1 and BRCA2 amongst other things in ovarian cancer. Giving you preventative options to greatly reduce your chances is another thing that doctor might be able to do. So here's another, here's the last question. If your doctor strongly suspects you may have ovarian cancer, and is recommending surgery, it is absolutely necessary to consult with who prior to a surgical removal. A gynecologic oncologist, another doctor for a second opinion, Google search, ask a close friend, all of the above or none of the above. 
The actual answer is you need to go to a gynecologic oncologist. It's important to go to that person prior to any kind of surgery. It's important because it's consulting that gynecologic oncologist prior, and I can't and I can't even overstate it. If you go to that person, that gynecologic oncologist, as opposed to a, your regular gynecologist or other non-specialized physician, your outcome is likely to be better, which is what my daughter did do. We went immediately to a gynecologic oncologist and we had to go out of town. It's not something that you're gonna find in a lot of towns. So you've gotta be willing to travel to do. So how are you feeling? Mm -hmm. Is your stomach feeling bloated or not feeling well? Are you feeling full really quickly after you eat just even a little bit? Maybe you don't have, can't eat, you're having problems or you have a lack of appetite. And I wish I had one of those bottles right here because I could sell you some really good stuff that's cure all, it'll fix anything. Oh. right that good stuff they used to sell so these symptoms of something being seriously wrong with your ovaries are really vague those are some of the the things that women will tell you the discomfort can go on for months and even years before the diagnosis is made and for my daughter it certainly was more than a year early on unexplained or frequent bloating pelvic or abdominal pain, trouble eating, or feeling full prematurely, urinary symptoms such as I gotta go all the time, or it hurts, the feeling of needing to go, and maybe you can't. They're so vague. You may not even have those symptoms in the beginning. Here are things that happen as we go on. You get fatigue or unexplained exhaustion indigestion or an upset stomach, nausea. You're not throwing up, but you really don't, you, you're close. You have pressure in your lower back or in your pelvis. You have back pain. You have pain during sex, constipation, Changes in your period, such as heavier bleeding or irregular bleeding, whereas you've been normal before. And abdominal swelling with light weight loss. This is one my daughter complained about. Mom, I'm down to a size four, but my stomach is all puffy. It's all very vague. She told her doctor more than once, and it was treated as you've got gas or, you know, you're just having a nervous stomach, all those things. With everything we know about, of, uh, about all the cancers we can get, all the different ones, ovarian cancer is still considered the silent cancer because there are very vague symptoms, if there are symptoms at all, and there are no definitive tests that will check it out. Even your annual visit to your gynecologist isn't going to assure you don't have ovarian cancer. So what can mimic the symptoms of ovarian cancer? The symptoms are of, of ovarian cancer are really confusing as we just went through because they share the traits of so many other serious conditions or may be experienced even just during a menstrual cycle. Just because you're experiencing these symptoms doesn't mean you have ovarian cancer. That's not, we don't, I don't, wouldn't would want to tell you that. But here are some of the other things you could have. Ovarian cysts, which is fluid filled pouches in or around the ovaries. These are common, these are not uncommon. They are taken care of primarily through surgery. And yes, they can burst and create some more issues but usually you find them surgery and you're fine. Irritable bowel syndrome, which is a <clears throat> chronic digestive order. That is something that can be 
checked out. But again, you have to go to the doctor. PMS, premenstrual syndrome. They used to laugh at us when this first came out. But it's the menstrual symptoms that a lot of us have in the days leading up to the period. So it can mimic some of those, but it doesn't mean you have it. Endometriosis, that's a common one as well. It's Then I never really knew until now what it really was. It's an abnormal growth, and I knew it was a growth, of the uterine lining outside of the uterus on surrounding tissue. So I didn't know that part of it. Other things that happen are our normal menstrual cycle, which can, of course, we get pelvic cramps. We have abdominal discomfort. We sometimes bloat. We have some of those very vague symptoms. Uterine fibroids, benign mus muscular tumors that grow in the uterine wall. My mother had a lot of those. They are usually harmless until they cause problems such as becoming really large or in my mother's case she had like non-stop period and so she was anemic so it became a problem so they did a hysterectomy pelvic infection which is something again it's usually caused by a sexually transmitted disease an std and we know that women Unfortunately, our age are some of the largest growing numbers of STDs because we are told we're too old. And pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, PID, which is something that is around. So these are some of the things that can mimic it. And again, the only way you can get diagnosed is to go to your gynecologist and have them check, give them what's going on and have them check. Ovaries are made up of three different kinds of cells, the epithelio, the ovarian germ and the ovarian stromal. Some of these are benign and never spread beyond the ovary. Malignant tumors or borderline tumors can spread or metastasize to other parts of the body. Once things have metastasized, mm -hmm. it's not really good. Epithelial cell tissues and cells are found everywhere in our body. They form the coverings for all of our body surfaces, line the body's cavities and hollow organs, and are the major tissue in glands. So epithelial cells are everywhere in our body. Epithelial ovarian tumors start from the cells that cover the surface of the ovary, and most ovarian tumors are epithelial cell tumors. So it's everywhere, which makes it even that much easier to spread. Benign epithelial ovarian tumors do not spread and usually do not lead to, to serious health problems. And there are several of those kind of benign tumors. Malignant epithelial ovarian tumors are called carcinomas. About 85 to 90% of malignant ovarian cancers are just that. They're epithelial ovarian carcinomas. There are four kinds with two grades and two types. And I'm not a gynecologist, so I can't tell you all that. Ovarian germ cell, that sounds really bad. Germ cells are the reproductive cells, eggs in women and sperm in men. Most ovarian germ cell tumors are benign, not all of them, but the majority of them. Less than 2% are actually ovarian cancer. And they are, uh, they are germ cells. Overall, they really do have a good outlook if that's what you are diagnosed with there are three subtypes of these ovarian germ cell tumors. The last one is that ovarian stromal tumors. The stroma is of the ovary is the connective tissue. About 1%, not very many, of ovarian cancers of, are ovarian stromal tumors. More than half of those are found in women past 50. But again, about 5% are found in young girls. There are three kinds of these stromal tumors and they are, that are malignant 
And these are usually found early and have a really, really good outlook because their symptoms are a little bit different. More than 75% of those of us diagnosed with ovarian stromal tumor survive. And that's a really good survival rate. So what are your risk factors? Oh, I love this one, getting older. Isn't that fun? The older we get, the more we can get, apparently. So ovarian cancer is rare in women younger than 40. Once you hit 40, they start going downhill, as my kids keep telling me. Most cancer develops after menopause. And for some of us, we went through an early menopause because we had surgery. Half of all ovarian cancers are found in women over 63. That's kind of an interesting number. Being overweight or obese, obesity has been linked to a higher risk of developing lots of different kinds of cancers. There's no real current information available on the relationship between ovarian cancer and obesity. It's there, but they don't know exactly why. Obese women do have a higher risk though, uh, but not, not necessarily for more, the more aggressive types, just you're more prone. Obese women do have an overall lower survival rate because it's hard on the heart and the body to heal itself after surgery if you are obese. Having children late in life or no full-term pregnancy, if, and I, I, I always think of, for some reason, Hollywood, because all these women are like, well, I waited until I was 40 to have my first child. That makes your risk of ovarian cancer higher because you didn't get pregnant until after you were 35. And if you've never carried a child full term, also have a higher risk. Taking HRT hormone replacement therapy can also have an in, make it give you an increased risk of having it compared to women who've never used hormone replacement therapy so it's something to consider when you're having those hot flashes having a family history of breast cancer ovarian cancer or colorectal cancer it can run in families your risk is increased if your mother your sister or your daughter has or had ovarian cancer and the risks are higher the more that there are within your family. Increased risk can also, also come from your father's side of the family. My sons, if my daughter had tested positive for either of the BRCA genes, we hear about that with breast cancer, but it's also true with ovarian cancer. It's not me that had to worry about being tested. My sons had to be tested. If they were positive, it's breast cancer. So men have to be aware also because they carry reproductive cells. They carry epithelial cells. It isn't just the women. Having family cancer syndrome. This is an interesting terminology. Up to 25%, one quarter of all ovarian cancers are part of the family cancer syndromes resulting in inherited changes or mutations in certain genes. And those mutations can come just because the body did it, or you've been exposed to something. Agent Orange is one of those kind of things that have created gene mutations. There's other things, other chemicals, foods, whatever that our body doesn't like or whatever, and we develop a family cancer syndrome. Uh, there's a whole slew of those that's in your handout and we could go through them and probably bore you to death. Hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, HBOC. Those are the BRCA1 and BRCA2, as well as some other genes that they haven't even identified as yet. And it's linked to, we think primarily of breast cancer because that's what it refers to but it also goes to fallopian tube cancer and peritoneal cancer, as well as ovarian cancer. So 
BRCA1 is breast cancer gene one, two is, is breast cancer gene two. They produce uh, hormones that help repair DNA. But when people inherit even one harmful variant, they have an increased risk. So it's a variant of those that they look for because they mutated and changed. Some of the other risks are hereditary, non polyposis colon cancer that has a nice HNPCC. Women with this syndrome have a high risk of colon cancer. So they then have a higher risk of uterine and ovarian cancer. This is also called Lynch syndrome, much easier to say. The next one is, and I am going to totally mispronounce this, putz jeggers syndrome. It's rare. It's a genetic syndrome that develops polyps in the digestive tract when these ladies, these young women or teenagers, they have a high risk for any digestive tract cancer. And so once it's there, it can go the, it, from the liver, the gallbladder, the stomach, and the intestines, and they have a really high risk then of ovarian cancer. There's the MUTYH associated polyposis, which is uh, developing polyps in the colon and small intestine and have a high risk of colon cancer. Hence, colonoscopies are important and they are likely to develop cancer like bladder cancer and ovarian cancer. And then the other ones are other hereditary, hereditary ovarian cancer genes. There's a really, really short list of those. Using fertility treatments, we, you know, a lot of women cannot have children the old fashioned way, I guess, if you want to call it that. So they use in, in vitro fertilization, and it seems to cause an added risk to getting ovarian cancer. And then having had breast cancer, of course, it's part of the reproductive system. So you run a higher risk, especially if you've had either one of the BRCA genes that are present, that that's what's caused it. And the last one, here's the one we all need to stop. If any of us are smoking, we need to stop because there are so many cancers associated with one thing, cigarettes or smoking of any kind. So if you are a smoker, please stop. If you haven't started by now, don't start. You run the biggest risk of getting malignant epithelial ovarian tumors of the, of the carcinoma kind if you smoke. Factors with unclear effects. This is an interesting one. Androgens such as testosterone, that's something they, I've, I've taken that to help with, ended up having a hysterectomy, but that was one of the treatments they used. Talcum powder, and we know that there's a lot of lawsuits out there and they say they can prove it, but scientifically they're still on the, they're sitting on the fence. They're not real, real sure. And the other one is diet. Does the diet play any kind of role in us getting ovarian cancer? And is it high fat? Is it what does if it if our diet does affect? Maybe it's some of the other things that we find in in the foods that we eat. You want to lower your risk. Pregnancy and breastfeeding. Women who've been pregnant and carried that baby to term before age 26 have a lower risk of ovarian cancer than those women who haven't had either one of, done one of those. The risk goes down every time you have a full-term pregnancy. Breast sleep, breastfeeding may lower the risk even further because sometimes it does help the first few months anyway of not ovulating. That's not true totally, but it does help. Birth control. The birth control they're talking about 
are the pills. You have a lower risk if you've taken birth control pills. This works, the, the effects of this works long past when you've stopped taking those pills. Tubal ligation and short-term use of IUDs, intrauterine devices, is also associated with a lower risk of ovarian, but it's the pills that have the biggest effect. A hysterectomy, and I've been told I've misspelled oophorectomy, which is a hysterectomy is removing only the uterus, not removing the ovaries. Oophorectomy is removing the ovaries because oof refers to eggs. And it can reduce your risk by about a third. Prevention. We're going to go through some of the same things. Don't take hormone replacements after menopause. Stop smoking if you smoke. Keep your weight down and eat as healthy as you possibly can. Women who eat diets with lots of fruit and vegetables are found to have a reduced risk. Take those oral contraceptives. Tubal ligation and a hysterectomy. An oophorectomy, if you've got a, if you've had breast cancer and you've had a BRCA gene mutation that's present, go have, have them take that all out as well. Prevention, getting pregnant before 40, but not in your early teens. That doesn't help you at all. That only makes it worse because then you spend a lot of years not being pregnant unless you want to have one every year for 40 years. I, I just think that would be, see, and breastfeeding. So testing, we already know you can't get tested for ovarian cancer, but what can you do to help? So one of them is an annual exam, telling your provider your risk factors, doing an ultrasound. So imaging testing, which is what an ultrasound CT and all that is, <laughs> excuse me, upper and lower barium imaging x-rays, which are not fun, but you can also do colonoscopies and endoscopy where they go in and they put you to sleep, or at least you don't feel anything. And they can, the lower barium enema, the reason it's important is it can be, it can tell them if it has spread at all. And then if it is confirmed, you have this diagnosis. Other tests include uh, a laparoscopy, a colonoscopy, and of course the real fun biopsies. The colonoscopy needs to be done a minimum of every five years longer if you have a low risk. And in case of very vague symptoms, you need to have this test because it can there's things in the colon that can mimic ovarian cancer. It's good to know. This usually is both the, the colonoscopy and the endoscopy are performed on an outpatient basis. You go in and, the, you know, you go in, you do it, you go home. A laparoscopy is done uh, using a real thin tube and a camera, and it's a little tiny incision so it's not very invasive and they can go in and see what's going on. Uh, they can also at that point do a biopsy if they think it's really going to be something they or they see something. This can also usually be performed as an outpatient. Biopsies can be done these show the, the cancer cells. We go in and get biopsies of stuff. I, you know, if you go to a dermatologist, a lot of times they will take a scraping or a cut and send it off and, and check it for skin cancer. These are used for all kinds of cancer, not just ovarian. Blood tests are going to be done. Just get over the needles because you're going to get lots of blood tests. And if you're diagnosed, the blood tests continue forever and ever. 
one test that you need to request if they did if they don't is a CA125. Men have when men have prostate cancer, their PSA number goes up. For women, it's a CA125 that goes up. Normal is 30 or below. At one point, my daughter's was over 2,000. So you got to know what your CA-125. For her, it was a marker every time it started going up that things were getting worse. After she had her chemo surgery, chemo, her CA-125 went down to nine. And a year later, it went, it started going back up. It went to over 100 and it never went down after that. If you are diagnosed with any kind of reproductive cancer, you need to have genetic testing done, especially for those BRCA1 and BRCA2. It's gonna help define, if you don't have them or if you do, or anything else, it's gonna help define what kind of chemo you get, surgery if it's needed, whatever is determined by you and your doctor. It is not just up to the doctor, it's up to you as well. So positive tests in family members, if you are tested positive, especially those BRCA genes, your family needs to get tested so that it can help them also lower their risk. Biopsy tissue can also look for gene mutations and they do a much better job than some of the other tests that can be done. There are a thousand BRCA mutations. The one we talk about most often are BRCA1 and BRCA2. So it, you need to know what kind of BRCA mutation you have if you get tested. All right, so now you've been diagnosed. The first thing you need to know is what stage are you at? You and the doctor are going to figure that out. And they do that because of the test that you had. Stage one can be in one ovary or both, and it hasn't spread anywhere. It's strictly in the ovary. Stage two, it has spread to the uterus, most likely, or other nearby organs. Don't forget the fallopian tube, the cervix. Stage three. Now we're getting serious because now it's spread to both ovaries, the lymph nodes, and or the abdominal lining. And you know that there's a lot of stuff in there in that abdominal lining. Stage four, it has spread to distant organs, such as the liver and the lungs. Once they have determined where you're at, my daughter was diagnosed at high stage three or stage four. So she was way up there to be diagnosed and treated. So she was given some options. Surgery, chemo, radiation are going to be the three major things they're going to talk about. And they're going to talk usually about a combo of those. If you have stage three, and especially if you have stage four, you may be a good candidate for trials. They've got a lot of new drugs out there, immunotherapy drugs that don't cure the cancer, but they give you a longer, better life than without. These trials can be included with a current chemo drug. In fact, sometimes that's the only way they can be given is with a chemo drug. They are closely monitored Many have a timeline and a time within that they have to be administered. My daughter was in a trial, so she took her pre-chemo drugs of like Benadryl and steroids, whatever. Then she was given her Taxol, her chemo drug, and then they had to wait 15 minutes. And during that 15 minutes, the trial drug had to be mixed in the lab and run upstairs and hooked into her. It's a, it was a seven hour day. So plan on that as well, especially if you're in a trial, it's gonna be longer and they monitor everything. It doesn't matter what treatment you choose, there's gonna be side effects to it. Taking an aspirin gives you a side effect. 
your doctor and the team will treat any of the side effects that happen. And they're very, if you've got a really good doctor, they will do a really good job of treating those. Any treatment that you decide on is between you and your doctor. It's not up to anybody else. It's you and your doctor to decide. The doctor has the science knowledge. The rest is you and your body. My mother said it when she hit 90, she didn't care. She was never going to do chemo or anything else. Find a good gynecologic oncologist. One who specializes. That's why I said gynecologic. They will keep up with the newest and the best treatments that are available out there. And there are new drugs being tested and coming on the market. They're going to order all the tests that are necessary. They're going to do regular checkups. And they're going to listen when you don't feel well or you have a new symptom. So there's a ton of questions that you need to ask. And here's where I'm going to tell you, you need to find someone to go with you when you go see that gynecologic oncologist. So some of the first questions to ask, because there's, there's like three sets. What type do I have? Is it epithelial cell? Is it a germ cell? Is it a, what kind do I have? Has it spread? Is it stage one or stage four? Two different things. What stage am I in? Do I need any other tests before we make a treatment change or a choice? They're going to check your blood levels because at some point your, your blood level is going to go down and they're going to have to hold off or give you treatments to bring that back up so you can tolerate the chemo. Do I need to see any other doctors or health care professionals? If I'm concerned about the cost or my insurance coverage for diagnosis or treatment, who's going to help? If you get a patient advocate, I know when Jody went to the Tucson Cancer Treatment Center, they provide that advocate who deals with those insurance companies who don't want to pay for anything. And they know how to work the system to get those insurance people to pay. Because it's very, very expensive to get this kind of treatment if you have no insurance coverage whatsoever. Another question to ask is, will I be able to have children after my treatment? Jody was recommended to have chemo and then surgery. And the doctor's question was, I can leave the uterus and you can have, you know, in vitro, you know, fertilization or whatever, if you want to have children. And my daughter said, I don't intend to have children, especially at this age. So no, take everything. But that's up to you. If you're younger, you may want to not do that. Should I get genetic testing? Yes. And what are my testing options? And that doctor's going to know. Okay, now you've gotten that far. You've gotten diagnosed and you've got those questions asked and the answers. Now you've got questions about the treatment plan. What are my options? There's always the nothing option. I'm just going to let it run its course and that's that. And if I got to be 90 or 94 or whatever, I probably wouldn't want to do anything either. You know, but it's up to you. What do you recommend and why? Ask the doctor. Here's where you've really got to have somebody with you because you're not going to remember the answers to all this. It helps having four ears instead of two. How much experience do you have in treating this kind of cancer? Hopefully you Google searched that doctor and you found out who she is or he is. Should I get a second opinion and how do I do that? Can you make a recommendation? Maybe you go talk to your primary care and get a recommendation. What's the goal of my treatment? Is it to just prolong my life? Is it to possibly provide a cure? What is the goal? How quickly do we need to decide? If you're at stage one, I would probably 
my only recommendation would be soon to prevent it from going any further. But that is, again, that's up to you and your doctor. What should I do to be ready for treatment? How long will treatment last? What will it be like? Where is it going to be done? How's it going to happen? Now, what are you going to do? What are you going to do if I have a reaction to it? All that fun stuff. What are the risks or side effects are there to those treatments that are being suggested? My daughter was taking Taxol. Side effect of Taxol, you lose your hair. Not all chemos do that. You got to know what the side effects are so you can figure it out. Are there things I can do to reduce these side effects? How might treatment affect my daily activities? Well, you know, you're not going to feel real good. My daughter still worked full time. She tried to work overtime when she could. She rarely took a day off, usually day of treatment. What are the chances the cancer will recur with these treatment plans? There's always a chance of re reoccurrence. Always a chance of reoccurrence. What will I do if treatment does not work or if it recurs? Once ovarian cancer is treated, if it comes back, the chances of survival go down each and every time. What if I have transportation problems getting to and from treatment? Fortunately for my daughter, some of those treatments could be done in Yuma. She didn't always have to go to Tucson to get her chemo. She could do it here in Yuma. Then there's another third set of questions. How will we know if the treatment is working? Number one, if you have a high CA 125, that number is going to go down. And there are other things that the doctor will look for. Is there anything I can do to help manage the side effects? Call the doctor. You will likely get the nurse as opposed to the doctor, but they will be sure to talk to the doctor, especially if you need a prescription for something. What symptoms or side effects should I tell you about right away? They will give you that list of if you experience any of these, immediately call or go to the ER, whatever. How can I reach you on nights, holidays, or weekends? There is always given a way to contact that doctor. Do I need to change what I eat during treatment? My daughter was told no and given uh, the only diet they told her absolutely not to follow was the keto diet, and they never told her why. Just said, absolutely, do not do that one. Are there any limits on what I can do? Can I exercise during treatment? If so, what kind should I do and how often? Do I need to go see a mental health professional? I, that I can see if I start to feel overwhelmed or depressed. And there's often times support groups that are available. What if I need social support during treatment because my family lives far away? Those were when those support groups are helpful. A good friend is helpful. And then there's one final set of questions. Do I need a special diet after treatment? Are there any limits to what I can do? This is after my treatment's all over, what other symptoms should I watch for? What kind of exercise should I do now? What type of follow work am I gonna need after my treatment's over? How often do I need follow-up exams and imaging tests? Will I need blood tests? The answer to that one is yes. How will we know if a cancer has come back and what am I gonna watch for? And what will be my options if this cancer comes back? These are all good questions regardless of what kind of cancer you have, but these are especially important if you've got ovarian. Again, take someone with you. You won't hear everything or comprehend. When my daughter was told she might be at stage four, she stopped hearing anything else that the doctor said. I asked her if I could go in with her to see the doctor. She said yes, and it's a good thing because there were things she wanted to ask and she didn't hear the answer. She asked the question, but she didn't get the answer with, over her head. You have to be your own advocate. If you cannot stand up to the doctors or the nurses or whomever, you need somebody there with you. But try really hard to be 
your own advocate. It does help. This month, and if you got your FCE flash, you will have seen this on there. September is Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. The color for ovarian cancer is heal, which is a blue-green. According to the CDC, it is the second most common gynecological cancer in the United States and causes more cancer than any other cancer of the reproductive system. So why do we not hear about it? Know the signs, know the symptoms, spread the word, share the knowledge, not medical advice other than go to your doctor and educate others. Spouses or significant others are sometimes more aware that something isn't right. You're not, you're just not quite your normal perky self, maybe. So include them in what's going on. Teal is our reminder color. World Ovarian Cancer Coalition is one of the websites that I have used. It's an interesting one to go to. There's also another one called the Ovarian, oh, uh, let's see, Ovarian Research Cancer Associates is another one, o OCRA, O-C-R-A. Current research suggests that ovarian cancer starts in our fallopian tubes and then moves to the ovaries. Treatments for ovarian cancer have become more effective in recent years. They were hoping with my daughter because she was right at 44, 45 when she was diagnosed. And they hoped because she was healthy otherwise and young. She walked, she exercised, she was not, she didn't have a lot of some of those basic risk factors. And we really hoped after treatment surgery and more chemo that she was considered free, that that would be the way it was gonna be. And it turned out not to be that way. But they, it's becoming more effective. There's a lot of things going on with the World Ovarian Cancer Coalition and with the Ovarian Cancer Research uh, Associates here. They are here in the United States. Remember the signs and symptoms and the risk factors. Do what you can do to minimize your risks. Don't be afraid to be your own advocate. Don't be afraid to stand up. And if, seriously, if you cannot, my mother would have been one of those, find somebody who's willing to do that. Be that person who gets in the doctor's face or whatever to get what you need to know, to stand up for that person for, for yourself. Don't be put off. Don't be saying, well, I've been in here six times complaining about this and, and it's the treatment you're offering me isn't working. Tell them you may be at risk. Experts advise that anyone who experiences unexplained abdominal symptoms lasting for more than two weeks should see their health care provider. Don't wait. Find a great doctor, check on them, listen to what they say. And if you don't like how you're being treated, walk out the door and find another doctor. Know what type of ovarian cancer you have and at what stage you're at. Know what the treatment options are and all the possible side effects for each one. And in the end, it's your choice. Educate yourself, your family, your friends, both on what we've talked about today. And if you are diagnosed, keep everybody in the loop. Don't be afraid to ask for help of any kind of help. And please don't be one of the 71 in 78 who gets ovarian cancer and does not get diagnosed. Please don't do that. No woman left behind. Get your checkups. All right, are there any questions? No? Hey, if you're done, Margaret, why don't you go ahead and uh, uh, stop your sharing and then we can see everybody too.
Okay. There you go. All right. Any questions? I don't. Well, I. Uh, the screen it, it doesn't. Uh, I couldn't see the whole program out across. I know this isn't a question, but I, this was kind of to Scott. So when he sends it to OSU, that it isn't cut off because that last one was cut off on some of that. Okay. Thank you for the lesson, Margaret. So oh, you're welcome. Joanne. I also, oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Mar Margaret. I just wanted to thank you for this. I think it's really, really critical. Um, I just had my fifteenth year anniversary. Um, oh. This, this um, actually, what's today? September fifth. Um, so I was diagnosed at stage three C. I was knocking on stage four, the Ooh. door of stage four already. My um, CA one twenty five was also in the two thousands, and I was. Um, receiving three chemos at the same time, Taxol, Carboplatin, and I was on a clinical trial, Avastin, yes. which is now a standard of care a drug. And um, as you mentioned, there are always, you know, all those effects. I had a, a chemo-induced heart attack. I had all my veins and arteries were shot. So yeah, yeah. you do a lot, um, but there are a lot of um, really good, uh advances that have been made since then i'm i'm so so sorry for your daughter um thank it you was really, uh chemo the hardest thing about chemo i was um, in chemo for 16 months and the hardest thing was not any of that it was um watching these young girls really young women i was 53 when i was diagnosed i didn't have any of those risk factors i didn't have yeah. I I did all those preventative things, tubal ligation, birth control, had a kid, everything. So you never know. You think you're you don't. They're you, just they're just helpful, but they're not I, a, they're yeah, not a guarantee. Yeah. Right. You're right. And, um I I had some of those symptoms, but they were all at the end. And when I talked to the doctor about it, she would just say, oh, you know, maybe it's this medication we have you on for brittle bone, yes. osteopenia. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. It was uh -huh. come back in three weeks. But um, for me, my biggest symptoms were um, at the end, the frequency of urination. Like mm -hmm. so I would do a, a pee diary at night and I knew something was wrong when I was ticking off. I've gone you know, I visited the restroom to pee 17 times tonight. Oh, so that's... yeah. And then when you tell them, they go, oh yeah, it must be that medication you have, you're on. Uh -huh. and then by the time for me, I didn't have to go to through any of that stuff. It was just emergency surgery. I'm in ER all of a sudden. So for anyone that's listening, men and women, yeah, just when something seems out of the ordinary, because, you know, I've always, I sound like your daughter, healthy, never overweight, doing all the things you're supposed to do, mm -hmm. pap smear every year, all of that, and nothing. So, right. yes, I highly recommend um, any woman to request a CA-125. Yes. Uh, because my- You got to get pushy sometimes. Yeah. And I'm so proud of you that you're advocating for, on behalf of your daughter for well, all thank of you. you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad you survived. Well, you know what? One I know, time, but one day at a time. One day yeah. at a time. Yeah. Thank oh. you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Thank you. Margaret, I have a question. Um, yes. That object quiz or uh, example thing that we did over the um, circle and the triangle, and uh -huh. was that a. Um, uh, 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 about the cycle of change was that a, it's a, it's just a bonding exercise to get you to yeah. be thinking about what, what it reminded me was the cycle of change and um you know because the mind is a powerful thing 
and um, and in order to get out of a lot of trials and tribulations and, and and things in life is a cycle of change because when I related to that and what when you relate when I what I related to that was um change and I related to every one of those symbols you know yes and when you relate to every one of those symbols <laughs> it's a different time of um uh, of, of change in your life usually mm -hmm. i mean not not everybody's but my life at a different point of pre-contemplation contemplating and and relapse and all those kinds of times in my life when um every different move i'm making in my life is a different time i relate to one of those those yes. different symbols so, so that's and, true and then an a powerful time in my mind when I'm I'm going through that cycle, it's a different time. I am more powerful in in making a movement, a, a movement of um of of where I'm going to what what and where I'm going to make the move next. So mm -hmm. so um like and like if you're having like for me, it would be you know maybe the power of addiction which is an impulse, you know, because there are multiple different kinds of addiction. But addiction itself is, yes, it's a disease, but it's more of an impulse, you know, that it is what it mm -hmm. is, what it all comes down to is a part of a, it's a impul impulsive behavior, you know. So the reason why it's uh, a disease is because it's a, a disease of impulse. You have this impulse that you, this desire that just won't go away. So you have to figure out why is this impulse so bad? Why, what is this desire that I have to break? You know, mm -hmm. and within me, you know, so it's the habit within me that I have to break. Control, not, not control, but, you know, you know, right. uh, calm down. Margaret, Margaret. So yes. That, once you have a total hysterectomy and all your fallopian tubes and everything, removed and ovaries you don't have to worry about cervical cancer anymore do you not cervical cancer but you still have to worry about if you if you didn't have any testing done of the tissue any biopsy done you may <laughs> still have to worry about other kinds of cancer um, but I'm, I'm not a doctor you still need to be concerned just be aware but I was only 30 when I had it done, and I'm 79 now. Well, you might not have to worry too much. <laughs> Anybody else have questions for Margaret? Well, I appreciate Margaret putting this together. I did send out on the chat that this uh, presentation, her PowerPoint, and the Leader's Guide is available on the national website. It's on the members page and you will need a password to get onto the members page and you'll need to contact your state president for the password. Uh, and, uh, I, I know it, but uh, I'm not going to tell you because it's supposed to come from your state presidents. And uh, if you have any questions, if you get that password and can't get in or whatever, just let me know and I'll help you do that. Any other questions or comments? I appreciate everybody doing here. I've actually learned uh, even some additional things and I watched it at the national conference and I'm going to get to at least watch it one more time. <laughs> and if not I'm, I'm going to thank uh, you for the presentation. I didn't see most of the PowerPoint, so it ended up I was mostly listening and watching your expressive face. And thank That's you for all the uh, thank you for all the information. Um, thank you. My, my, I have a question because I'm starting on a breast issue and I'm going to meet with the surgeon person, whatever, in the near future. Should I ask, because I know I've had blood tests, ask if I've had a CA-125 or request one and would that be I helpful? Would, yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, that's been it very is a, it's a, it, it's It's CA because it's a cancer marker. Okay. So that is one that's really important to, to get checked for okay. if you're having a breast issue they also need to do uh unless they can 
show you otherwise, you also need to get tested for the BRCA1 and BRCA2. Okay, because I wrote that down as well. So yes, because that's very- those are important. Okay, well, thank you much. This is I wanted I want to keep up on these Zoom meetings, and I I know I've missed one or two, but we can get all this information then, Scott, through the national websites. And I think yes. probably well, I, I know our state president and Connie, our na- former national person, have been out to national. And so I know we'll get that stuff because we'll be presenting that to our clubs. So um, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank this, you. This one, along with the other new ones from the nationals, are available on the members page. They were also sent out on the flash drives that were given to every participant that went to the uh, conference. Uh, and this presentation, and like the others, are recorded, and they are available on the Oregon FCE website, which is uh, www.oregon dash, and then make sure you put the dash in there, fce.org, and go to the Zoom meetings. And I think I think this is we're finishing up on three years of these, so there's some really good ones. And I see Faye there; she's done at least one or two of them. So. so- so the question is, if we're having a meeting, is it okay then, because um, we have permission to use the lessons, can we bring this up as a PowerPoint and show it to our whole group? Should be able okay? to, yes. You we, should be able to. Okay, because uh, that would be helpful so that you yes. make sure you get all the points, like the second set of ears. <laughs> yes. In, uh, and I, I'm the second set of ears for my mother-in-law, so I understand. <laughs> Some, I was the second set for my daughter and my husband. So okay. some yeah, groups are important. using the recordings of the of these Zoom lessons. Uh, the state of Alaska, I know, has done a couple of them up there. So okay. In the state of Can in the state of Kansas, this hearth fire will be one of the educational programs we are offering to our members. So it's going to go out to um, each unit that we have as a leader's guide, the hearth fire and the uh, brochure. So if they like to copy out the brochure and distribute it, they can do that. Okay. Is the quiz available to that online? Yes, it should be there as well. Okay, All of it, the, the shapes, bonding, everything should be there. Okay. okay. Yes, it's all in one booklet. Yeah, and I had 180 copies made for the state of Kansas. Okay, thank you. You're uh, welcome. And I do have some wonderful upcoming ones. And I think, Joanne, you're doing one in November. November, I think, in November. And we've got uh, one in October. And by the way, the one in October is going to be on Thursday because we have our state conference, so I have to move it to Thursday. I know it's every the first Wednesday, but uh, we'll still be at our state conference, so that will be on Thursday, and then uh, uh, November will be Wednesday. And I've got, uh, if, if you wanted to do a pres- presentation, I'm always looking for them. My next opening is February, and that's a heck of a problem. <laughs> it's a wonderful problem to have. Thank you very much for all attending. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Linda Hess? Is Linda still on? I am.